Okay, so um, we're going to move into a discussion session. So um, if anyone wants to start it off about anything to do with um, stock assessment model features that we talked about pretty much all today and a little bit of uh, yesterday afternoon. Yeah, I was going to ask if anyone had any ideas before I contaminated them with my focus questions. So. <laughs> But if no one has any questions, then I will put them up. Can I ask a question about the um, last talk? Just sure. While yeah. you're finding something. <laughs> what? <laughs> um, great talk. Um, I gotta think of the question now. Uh, how would you relate agent-based modeling approach to more formal or basically a, a technical interaction model? I mean, it's basically you're, you're modeling the aspects of a technical interaction model, but at a very fine scale. That, that's one of the questions I had. The other question I had is like, what things like when you say market driven, I mean, knowing what's market driven can't be an easy task. Um, yeah, so what do you mean by um, technical? Can you define- So technical interaction technical, is yeah. where you've got multiple fleets catching multiple species yeah, okay. and they're restricted by some things. Yep, yeah, so it's, it's very similar to that in, in the sense that you can have multiple fleets and, and we do in, in multiple species. We don't, we, neither model has uh, ecosystem interactions at this point and Poseidon's probably not going to. I'm, I'm trying to stuff them into the golf model eventually. I've got a student building an ecopath model of the golf with a bunch of, I know, I know. Ecopath's not dynamic anymore. Not, is it, yeah, is it, okay. Is well. it like, a, I mean, do you take into account fuel costs and things yeah, like that? Yeah, yeah, so from the economic side, yeah, it accounts for, for the market price of fish and then all the costs, fuel costs, bait, you know, operating costs, all the sort of the typical, um, uh, vessel costs, and then it just does simple accounting in terms of knowing, you know, if you're profitable or not. Um, and then our, there was another part to your question. I don't remember what it was. Just the, the the unknown things that you're putting in. I mean, presumably you test those by sensitivity, like what what market factors. You know, I, I know in the fishery, I know a lot about. It's pretty hard to predict what what's going to be the. I mean, they have specific orders. But it's pretty hard to know what those orders are in terms of product. Yeah, uh, yeah, thing. yeah, yeah. Exactly. Yeah, and so that they're not so much looking. It's not quite to that finest granularity level of looking at actual or at the order level, but more driven by you know frequency of you know trips per month and or those kind of things or you know weather events that that kind of thing that would that would in other words. On, on a given day, what are the factors that will decide that will help you decide to go out or fish, you know, and then you sort of toss away the coin based on that. Okay, so does anyone have any of these focus questions that they prefer to talk about first? He does. Yeah, Rick. I will. Okay. On the first question, a um, few notables in our field have recently brought on to the FMSY project where there's this advocacy for basically production models because they inherently subsume all aspects of density dependence in a non-specific way. Uh, we tend to not look at density dependence in the age structured models and anything other than recruitment. So I, I'm wondering about the degree to which we uh, have become too, too focused on one aspect of things in the age structured models and have not um, looked broadly enough at some of the other aspects in which biologically the fish are compensating for the effects of exploitation. Does anyone want to answer that question? 
I guess the question that, well, firstly, I think we can delete delay difference models except for homework assignments. They were designed to be intermediate, and I think that, you know, 1980, that was a valuable goal, but I think that goal has ended. Um, I, I do think the surface production models have a role to play. Um, you know, a lot of the work, the simulation work has suggested those estimates of FMSY are estimated, they're numbers, but they can be extraordinarily biased, um, uh, in particular because of uh, age structure transient effects that, is, that you're seeing as, as dynamics. Um, so, you know, uh, while I think the idea of taking account of multiple sources of density dependence is, is, is good, uh, I have yet to see someone prove to me that these models actually can capture that. Uh, theoretically, they can, um, but you know, I, I've done enough simulations with age structured models as operating models and surface production models as estimators to know you get some nasty, nasty biases. Um, I'd love to know how well things like Jabber do, because Jabber at least accounts for process error, which a lot of the old models didn't. I'm not sure if your friends have got... Yeah. Uh, in, I take, my lawyers have told me it's not in my interest to respond to that remark. Um, but yes, there, there, are, there are some issues about the models that are being applied there. Any, any other comments? Um, yeah, uh, okay, Anista. Um, well, I, I think we, at least in my, in my mind, they're still, uh, I'm still a bit behind this, this level of detail. And uh, I'm, I'm still thinking if, if we are actually talking about building a, a Uber model, if we are talking about building a framework where different models can plug in, or if we are talking about creating a language of models, which at some point yesterday someone mentioned, because for me it's not clear uh, what, what is exactly, or, or if there is already a, a, an opinion about what are we trying to do. Uh, those three different approaches, I would say, would bring different replies to these questions. Fair enough, delay different model. Uh, okay. Uh, it's like Fortran 77. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> so I, I think what we're trying to do is we're trying to produce a, a, a general model that can be used for most assessments. Um, obviously, we can't use it for all assessments. There'll be some assessments that won't fit into that framework. Um, my opinion in this is that surplus production models are so different that they probably should be relegated to a separate piece of software rather than integrating it into this software. Uh, my opinion about using them is I think you should never use them, um, particularly since you probably can't estimate the production function and that's the biggest issue with these models. And if you don't define all the age structure components, you don't have the prior on those, um, that, um, the shape parameter. Um, yep. so I, I'm not sure I agree with your, your answer to your previous question because I'm not sure that you got the right question. Um, I, I, I've been seeing this topic not as the model. I don't, I don't want, we don't want to create Sauron. Um, I'm, I, I, would, I like the idea of multiple models and how you integrate those models into a super package is, I think, an interesting sort of development question. But I guess the question for me with these topics here is more if you have got a package and we've got at least four or five that are pretty damn good, um, what are the next steps that people should be looking at as they develop those models further? So for, for me, the thing that isn't here is, is dealing with random effects. So if you're not dealing with random effects correctly, I think it's time to, that's a step that all packages should be dealing with. And I think I, I would look at this list from that, the point of view of what, are, you know, it, as we develop all these packages further, assuming that none of them go away, what are the things that we really should put high on the to-do list? So uh, for Gadget, for example, it'd be nice to have a minimizer that doesn't feel like it is in Fortran. Um, you know, so there, there, there's sort of standards like that. And I think, that would help all the developers probably more than anything else. I don't think we're all going to agree to throw our models out and come up with one single model. Well, um, unless it's Gadget. I mean, you should <laughs> always be using Gadget. Um, but I did, didn't I? <laughs> so, 
my comment, I wasn't saying that sh there should be only one general model in development. There might be different groups that want to produce their own general model, but I'm guessing that we should be producing something like stock synthesis or castle two that can be applied in most situations. And then there'll be probably other developmental models that are quite different that once they've been developed and tested that those features would be integrated into these other more general packages. As one of you just said, you know, the current models aren't going to go away right away. Um, and it, I think thinking about it, the list in terms of, well, what are challenges for our current models? Where, where are they going to be very difficult to extend in some directions? And hence, they, those desirable characteristics like fully adding random effects into all aspects of SS or converting it to work in a TDMB, it would be easier to rewrite it, right? I think. All right, we can have that discussion. But I mean, I think what I want to think about the list in terms of what is it that is too challenging to try to easily add and where do we need uh, some new development efforts to achieve the capability we want. Some of it though is in terms of uh, reworking the, the interface to our models to make them more accessible to a broader community. Because we, we're here as you know, developers or power users at least who are quite adept, but we also have a lot of assessments that are not done by people with that experience level. I think we need to be aware of servicing that part of the community. Yeah. So, so just to answer the last question, so that's basically the whole focus of CAPM is to develop these best practices, which can then be put into some kind of, you know, guide to help people set up their models. Um, yeah. So, any other comments on that? Yeah, um, Jim. Sorry for the front table hogging the mic and speaking, but. Um, one thing I don't see on this list and, and I think is important, well, a couple of things. One is uh, nobody really talks about projecting what next year's weighted age is going to be and what the uncertainty in that next year's weighted age is and propagating through and reminding you all that our um, quotas are generally speaking, except for salmon maybe, uh, in pounds of fish and most of our models are in numbers. So to translate and fishing mortality is something that we're, I think we try to estimate uh, to some degree. And, and, and so it's really important, I think, and nobody talks about it, is to acknowledge cohort effects and uncertainty in year effects in our fishery where we have lots of data. The CV on well estimated average weights at age is on the order of 15%. Uh, per year and that's those are extremely well estimated average weights at age. It's just the fishery what they encounter could be due to cohorts could be due to year effects where they fish when they fish um, and you know for the, the halibut assessment they use empirical weights at age and so projecting forward uh, it's important to acknowledge that uncertainty and also if there are density dependent cohort effects they can have huge impacts on target fishing mortality rates if you get it wrong. Yeah, uh, I, I will also return to that in, in my presentation on Thursday. But I think you're absolutely right with that uh, stock weights. And, and I think Noel has, Noel Cadigan has said it the most clearly of anyone that anything with a Y subscript should really be a random effect. That's yeah, Ian. That, 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 that allows you to predict stuff. <laughs> well, that would also have a Y effect, Y subscript. <laughs> so anything about the Y subscripts? <laughs> okay, yeah, Ian. What? I guess I'm curious. Yeah, I was going to say, I can't think of anything that wouldn't. I like Mark's idea of the grand new model that doesn't have to be Sauron, that there's, there's a, you know, happier path. I guess what, 
at some point it seems like we have to talk about staff and money. You know, if you're, I mean, right now the current approach is whoever pays for the model chooses what goes into it. You know, NIWA pays for Castle 2. It looks like it has a lot of potential, but unless somebody else steps up to contribute time or money, why should they include anything else other than what NIWA needs? So, yeah, you so know, Rick happens to be very amenable to, to including features that Mark or others ask for. But I, I think logistically, you know, if, if we all buy into some association of stock assessment users and put all our money to cap them and have cap them hire the programmers and create the document, I mean, that could work really well. But, but it seems like that you can't divorce the, the gatekeeping and this, you know, what's included from the structural questions of who's actually doing the work and who's in charge. Yeah, that's, that's a good comment, and we'll get to that on Friday when we talk about project management and funding and things like that. Yeah. Um, um, maybe, maybe we shouldn't even be talking about building software, but just gathering requirements at this point, right? Pretty much, yeah. But we also need to, to discuss the structure of how the project would be set up, because another component of this that needs to be put in place before you start even doing coding, things like that. Exactly. So, Okay, um, one, one thing that I heard just in the discussion was, I can't remember who brought it up, but was basically what in the current models is there that does, is, is not going to, well, what do we want in the current models that we can't put in there without rewriting the code? And so it was brought up that random effects and, and changing over to TMB to make it more efficient maybe. What else is there? Is, I mean, is, is the capability of doing the tagging um, type analysis good enough in the current models or if it's not can we modify it so it would be or do we have to rewrite the code to make it more efficient yeah this is I've been trying to think through this and saying what there's two dimensions there's where will we be whenever it is we have the next captive to have the same discussion because we will do this again um, and you know that's when you hit the multi-species there's a there's a point at which multi-species matters the question is will I be around to care and I'm not sure I will be. Um, so that's way beyond anything we have except perhaps gadget right now. Um, a lot of the things on your list and that we've talked about are doable. What's the challenge is not that they're doable, it's that we can't do them efficiently enough to make them practical. So for example, multi-species models with lots of areas and partitions and stuff, I can write down the equations right now, we all can but we can't get the damn things to work before we all die of old age. So, you know, the, the, I think there's, the, 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 I don't see a lot of technical challenges except perhaps the random effects one, but there's certainly, how do we make some of these things happen in, 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 in software that we will be able to run in the time that it matters? That to my mind is the, is the sort of the, the real challenge for where we move forward. And, you know, that's, I guess, why we heard about software engineering to start with. So some of these problems are not, fundamentally modeling problems, they're fundamentally implementation problems. Um, but the, you know, the, the, the exception perhaps being the, the random effects and the associated uh, Bayesian calculations where th there's, there's an there's a actual development step at a theoretical level that needs to happen before we really hit this properly. Yeah, Eric. Yeah, I, we've, we've focused a lot on all the bells and whistles we'd like to have in the software, but I think Rick was hitting on a point that I don't want to have go away, which is the user interface that we put on these models is almost equally as important because that's what attracts users in some ways too and, and makes it a more broadly used tool is how, how steep that learning curve is or not really depends on that user interface and includes things like error trapping and and making mistakes and making sure that the code catches that so that you're not flipping switches on or off that are nonsensical uh, the you know time spent on that is time well spent in my mind and we should not overlook that okay yeah an, an important component again we i think we're going to touch on that on thursday maybe yeah uh, yeah down the back yeah yeah i um i mean one thing just a general kind of question, I guess, is today kind of we've talked a lot about the age link um, and, you know, in terms of a spec of this hypothetical future model, um, 
whether you would want you, uh, cutting around numbers at age, numbers at length, or numbers at age and length, uh, whether that's uh, even possible. Um, I don't know, that's just a general. Today, today I, there's a lot of length stuff, but um, I don't know if there's any, I mean, Castle, I think has kind of a forked code base and it allows you to have purely age structured and purely length structured, but it's a, it's a bit of a nightmare. Um, um, and so, you know, whether we want this or not should be an early decision because then it's going to define kind of data structures. Yeah, so that paper that uh, Rick McGarvey pointed out, essentially what I did there was it's, it's full age size structure uh, with a, essentially growth as a size transition matrix. So it's like a, the growth is like a size structured model, but it's got inherent age in, in it. But what really mattered was be able, it was a scalable uh, structure. So you could basically say, I want an age length structured model with one age class. And then it, it essentially was able to collapse in any direction because although it's cool to have age length structure, it really only matters is if F is big enough. If F is pretty small, those assumptions that we all think are completely stupid and unrealistic are actually pretty damn good. Uh, but it, you know, once you get the Fs of Northern Cod, uh, yes, things are actually happening. But can we do it? Yes. Is it, is it computationally bad? No, not, not if, you, if you want a thousand length classes, well, you're gonna get what you pay for. But uh, I, I think that's well within what we can do now. <laughs> so, uh, I'm glad we got back on the age length topic. An aspect of it that I've tried to address in SS, and I think we, I think it's underappreciated, and it's basically the, the time steps, the fact that fish are growing pretty fast in there, and we, I see too many annual models with size data. And so you got to calculate the age length key for some point in time during the year, when in fact the fish are growing continuously through the year. Your data may be co collected continuously through the year. I think we have in general a temporal mismatch when we're looking at size data uh, on how we model the time steps. So the thing that I have at SS right now is the ability to create an age length key at a particular point in time and to you know, get interpolate growth to that date and calculate an age length key for that date to compare to that observation, um, which of course creates a new kind of overhead. Uh, but I think it's an aspect that is, um, is something that needs to be addressed in our, in our modeling if we're gonna be using uh, at the fitting of, to length data. Yeah, um, that's that's probably an important component, and we'll probably see a little more about importance about that later in the week when we talk about the depletion models. Uh, any other? Yeah, Jeremy. Uh, not stealing my thunder for tomorrow. I'm talking about simulation, but I think there are, there are clearly two aspects to consider here. We we use these models principally as estimators, principally as tactical models, and, and there are requirements for that, and there are assumptions that we have to make just on the quality of the data we've got to be able to fit things that we'd like to fit or not be able to fit. But the other aspect is the simulation, and I guess the question is how complicated we need simulators to be. And in terms of some of the things like whether you have length age um, capability in the model, you probably want that capability in a simulator. And do you need to put it in your, in your main model or do you need to develop just a separate simulator that does that and lets you test the main model? I think that's it's kind of the question of the complexity is what's the role of the model? I mean, just to go to that, we were talking about uh, agent-based models. Uh, Syrah, when I was there, developed uh, essentially a 3,000 Sp uh, the Great Barrier Reef down to the individual reef, which is crazy. Uh, no estimator in his life, you know, my lifetime is going to estimate that. But part of that was to, is to really to get to the point um, uh, that we heard last time, which is how biased things can be. And it turns out if you've got a lot of spatial structure, in this case, a lot of variation in growth spatially, 
you're screwed. Uh, it was sort of not the result you wanted, but that's what it is. Uh, and there was sort of no estimator that we could find that got rid of a lot of those biases. You just had a sample and monitor. You couldn't really, you couldn't extract what was in the underlying operating model because the structure was just too complicated. And I think the same applies with growth, uh, length and age, that kind of stuff. So in an age-based model, there's, there's hardly any cost to having a simulator that's an agent-based model with you know, mul super individuals, not individual fish, but super individuals that have their own properties and stuff. And you can learn a lot about how well some of these assessment models don't work. But yeah, so this is where agent models, in my opinion, really come in, is, is to, be, to be able to set up really sophisticated and realistic operating models. Yeah, so we can continue the discussion about simulation models, I think tomorrow or the next day, um, when we talk about... Yeah, he could, he would, he's got the answer. What, what, we, what we discussed discuss this make morning. Your <laughs> well, make your own question up there. You told me what to talk about. <laughs> That's because they're not in today's talk. Okay, thanks, Andre. So I saw there was a question over here. Yeah, Ryan. Uh, one thing that I think there was a lot of agreement on that is pretty low hanging fruit is making the models more compatible with input, like output that's standardized somehow and having standardized um, software that, you know, makes diagnostics and, and that kind of stuff that pretty much everyone has developed independently. That's all replicating the same wheel. Yeah, that would, that would be useful. Another thing that's related to that is it would be good if a lot of the, um, stock assessment data was available for simulation testing and things like that. There's been a few projects where you take, um, you know, the current assessments, use those to condition an operating model and you simulate data and then fit to that simulation data to see how well you can estimate different parameters or what biases help. And um, by having all those um, consist consistencies and in, in data output and everything, and it would make it easier to put together those big databases to do a lot more impressive uh, testing of the models. Yeah, Rick. May I ask just a technical question? Are we, since so many assessments, at least in Australia and North America, use synthesis now, will this new model replace synthesis or will it presumably be possible to parametrize it with control flags of some sort so that it can duplicate it? Or how will it interact with what, how will what we have now with synthesis as being such an important tool be carried forward into this new tool? Great. Well, specific to you. <laughs> Gee, thanks. Um, I mean, uh, of course, at some point, it replaces it. I mean, I hope it's a smooth transition. Um, you know, I think we need to take the lessons learned. Uh, that's why I asked the question earlier, well, what is it that's hard to do with our current models that really drive us towards uh, the design document for what we need to do with the new model? Now, there may be a few things in the current models that we decide that, you know, it's just don't need it. And you know, that could be part of this as well. But I, I do envision this effort leading to a new generation of models. And when that happens, uh, the old models eventually go away. It doesn't happen overnight, but they eventually go away. Just like we're talking about Fortran and surplus production models. Fortran dropped out of my All right, <laughs> just make sure you're listening. <laughs> um, but, but eventually it does replace, uh, but hopefully it's a smooth transition and hopefully we can, as we're doing here this week, you know, taking the lessons learned and figured out, well, how do we build something that even better meets our needs? Clearly SS has turned out to meet the needs of a large number of people. I'm very pleased by that, but it, it's hard and there's certainly warts on it and there's certainly things that we could do better collectively. Okay, anything else? Yeah, Andre. The topic is features, and I guess we haven't seen, and I'm, I'm gonna ask you, Mark, because I'm gonna blame you if it's not done. Um, 
we, we've been collecting information on what are the features in the different models. Um, and I think if it's not right now, as an outcome of this meeting, having that summary so that each, you know, even if you're not one of the big four uh, or big four and a half, if you include Sam, uh, which is code wise, I think a little shorter than the others. Um, where are we and what are other people doing? Because I think, you know, I don't think anyone in this room can claim to know all the big four, maybe Rick can, I don't know, well enough to be able to say, you know, Gadget can do what Multifan can do. And these, are the, so I think there's a, a step before we design the big model to know who's done what, rather than develop, you know, I don't know, the Gadget predation function, I would look at what Gadget does. So I think we, there's a step here that says, where are we? And I don't think we really have got that synthesis of, of what are the strengths and weaknesses, if, if you want to call it that, of the different approaches? I, I actually have a presentation somewhere here on that. So, Andre, I will allow you to moderate. Apparently, I'm moderating. You're going to, Ian. Uh, Andre, is this on? Aren't you involved in the project with Rick as well, that Neil Clare is, is principal person gathering information on what features people are actually using, at least for the subset of stock synthesis users, and where's that data? Uh, the, uh, the key authors of aforementioned paper are discussing the process of discussing where we're going. Piaki. Yeah, this is actually a question that I've gotten a couple of times, is how, you, how do you translate a gadget model into stock synthesis, for example. And uh, the short answer is, I have no idea because I haven't, haven't touched stock synthesis. And, uh, but that would be an interesting exercise to, uh, to look into how, how we can do just the same model across these, these uh, big four and a half or, or five modeling frameworks. Yeah, I mean, I've started, it, it, Kathy back there and I have got a project on packages. And so we've been trying to do some of that and you know, basically format the same data set into multiple packages. And, you know, it, as I've looked at that, it's the thought of, is there a way, as we develop these models, thinking about, and, and it does require collaboration, essentially when synthesis moved from two, whatever it is, three point something to three point three, whatever it was, whatever the change was, it was really helpful to have a translator. So basically a specific piece of software that took the old input files and more or less got to the new ones. It wasn't always perfect. Anyone who did this knows that that was true. No, I used your software. Um, but I think that kind of, as if, if, this, if the outcome of this meeting is essentially a group of people who are wanting to collaborate more, that product would be very helpful. Because I think you're, you're right. I, I think one of our difficulties is we come, we, we're, we're experts in our package and we know the other packages exist. And that's often as far as it goes. Oh, lots of questions. So uh, Kathy, uh, Kathy, then Kelly, then um, Brian. Brian. Do we have the, while he's doing that, do we have the microphone, Scott? It's okay, oh. I think I've got something. Oh, there it is. Um, I was just going, coming back to uh, a little bit of um, thinking to the beginning. Um, in a way, a lot of them, the packages that we've got in hand are, have a little bit of a bias towards data richness and age-based modeling. And, and I, I think there's a great value in looking at what packages have got and what they're good at and what they, what they need to still have. I think there's a lot of value in doing that work, but I don't think we should perpetuate some of the past. There's a big world of fisheries stock assessments that still need to happen, many of them very data limited, and many of them hard to age species, and many of them not with very large um, data sets or none. Um, and the question is, at what stage does the Uber model actually break apart from that and say, now that's a separate model. And so I wonder whether it isn't something we should actually do much more in a, in a design sense and say, we've got, we've got information that starts with length only, no age, that's the hard to age animals, all the way to age only, no length. 
um, you know, and actually look at the dimensions we've got and say, can all of those dimensions be in, in one Uber model or not? Or do we create a few and they are emphasizing certain things like one that emphasizes hard to age species, one that emphasizes tagging that data that is highly spatial, like the tunas, et cetera. And I think, I wonder whether that's not really actually the question yet before we start going into further detail. Yeah, I think Chad Paul's talk kind of addressed much of that, that the proper separation of the population model from the observation model, you can have a population model that works with very scant observations. I agree, and I, but it looks like the discussion seems to go off that. Um, and so I'm just trying to bring us back to that, which is um, I just don't want to, I don't want us to lose out on, on the fact that there is actually a lot out there that, um, that needs to be included. I personally think Chantel's talk was, was great, and I, that's what I'd like to see happen. <laughs> Um, and and I, I just like to see that as a decision. <laughs> maybe that was maybe should be my question is are we sitting and saying we want to have one assessment that can go across that whole spectrum or not? I personally say I personally would like to, but I haven't actually got a clear answer from the group on that. I, I think that decision gets to some of the things that Matthew was saying about modularity and scalability and being able to build the model so that it can do those things, but when it tries to do those things, it's not hampered by lots of other inputs, lots of other overhead. So, you know, there should be inherent ability to scale down to doing something that's pretty simple and also being scaled up. One of the shortcomings of the structure of SS is that the whole aspect of estimating growth is too permeating throughout the code for me to separate it so that it could operate strictly as a statistical catch at age model without the overhead of the growth stuff would be prohibitive. Um, so, I mean, I think good design in a modular way is the answer to your question that I think we need to have the capability, but we need to do it in a modular way. Okay, let's before I hand the mic back to um, Mark, I think I had Kelly, you wanna, Brian. and then Brian, yeah. I just wanted to comment on the input output files and conversion between them. I think uh, Ernesto can maybe speak to the ICs initiative to standardize input output files. And then there's also work being done within the methods group working group, I, Arnie's group, that to translate those, like I think four different uh, stock assessment frameworks that are used within the US to those input output files. And so then not only could you go to the ICs format, but then from any um, ICs, you could go to the opposite direction. And so work is being done there, but I think ICs is kind of the potential go-to on how that initiative was more broad than just on a few people's computers. I'll follow that up and then I'll go to Brian. Yeah, I, th I think, well, uh, ICES uh, uh, took over a, a couple of these things because uh, in, in ICES there is, uh, well, people recognize the same problem that everybody did, which is we have different models and sometimes you want to compare the results of using different models for the same data and you want to do it in an efficient way. Um, I think in, in the end it brings us back to the question I was making. Are we looking for a Uber model or for a framework that allow us to actually develop models where you said, oh, I think we should have several models. And then Mark said, no, I want to have one model. So we got, we got a bit stuck there. And uh, I'm coming back to what FLR was and what FLR tried to do. FLR tried to be a framework. So there was never the idea that FLR was going or the group dealing was going to develop for everything. There was the idea of having a well 
well-defined data structure that would allow people to develop their own models. Using the same data structure, we were able to, at some point, come back and compare what we were doing. Um, that, those initiatives in ICES are still based on that idea. And, and me personally, I think that is the way forward. I don't believe on a, sim, on a model that uh, a pair of boots and, and an espresso tonight. So we, I don't believe on that, simply. And I think that uh, in, in the end of the day, it creates fragilities for us as a community if we give advice for a, a large number of, of stocks uh, uh, across several um, uh, areas of the world based on a single model. Even if it's a Uber model, well designed, I don't believe on that. So I think as, as a community, we are better protected if we actually have several models. And what we need is we need to, to say, as we are doing here, these are characteristics that we believe they, they should exist in the models. And we should speak more about that platform that should allow us to have uh, uh, features transferable or, or data transferable or results transferable. So we can actually work on MSCs, we can work on ensembles, we can work on all those things that people want to work. Uh, that, that, that's uh, my opinion and I think uh, the ISIS initiatives in some way go on the same type of direction. I'm hoping Mark's taking notes. I think that was an outstanding contribution. So agree, agree with you, especially as it disagrees with Mark. Uh, uh, Brian. Um, just to comment on Mark's questions about um, features that are challenging. And looking at the list that was posted, um, spatial features weren't, weren't up there. And um, I know there's been a lot of work in, of, around that issue in the past and certainly into the future with the NSAW. Um, looking at the multi-fan presentation today. So, so there's work on doing that. I guess I ask then, is, is that because spatial features are now easy to do or is that still remains a, a, a feature and topic that, that needs more work? From my point of view, I think there's a, there's a lot of synthesis of what's out there that's needed. I think we've got a lot of parts. Um, I'm still always worried that have we have got the data to support we can run ahead of the models in, in particular in the spatial area really quickly. Um, so Bering Sea Pollock might be able to, you know, get down to 500 square mo uh, boxes, but the rest of us poor sods are in that, not in that category. Mark, uh, you want to do whatever it is you're about to do? Okay, since I got the microphone, I'll make some comments as well. So as far as the, the framework versus the general model goes, I think we can probably all agree that we probably need both. We need a general model like Stock Synthesis and Castle that you know, takes on the, the, the current challenges and overcomes those, but also to have this framework where we can actually interact between the different models so that we can basically compare the results of different uh, software packages and things like that. So I don't think there should be too much of a disagreement, but um, I wasn't really thinking about that during this workshop, so I think it's great that you brought that up because we should make sure that's a focus as well to make sure that everything's consistent so that we can have, you know, packages of diagnostics and all these things that can be applied to all the different models so we don't have to actually um, reprogram those. And I guess it may be tomorrow or, or the next day we might be talking about diagnostics and, and user interfaces, which is that's what that part of it is. Okay, and as regards to spatial models, that's one thing that hasn't come up is things like the vast model. So now everyone's doing these spatial temporal models and it's great, but how does that feed into stock assessment models? I know Jim Thorson's and one of his postdocs um, has been working on a stock assessment model that is sort of developed with inside vast, but I don't think it's a very complicated model. And I <laughs> and if it gets complicated, then it's going to be hard to uh, basically implement and, and, and run. Okay, so um, I'll just go over this before we go to Bear. Um, so I put out a survey um, to get information on the current general uh, stock assessment packages, and I got a pretty good uh, response. So that's the list of all the models there. Um, I also got one from Anders on Sam, but I haven't included that in the summary yet. Um, and Sam's quite different, so it it's, would be a good one to have in here as well. 
But a couple of things to notice about some of these. So uh, Poseidon is an agent-based model. We saw that today. So that's quite different from standard stock assessment approaches. Uh, WAM uses random effects as its sort of main base. And so does uh, Anders's model, both in TMB. Uh, Jabber is Bayesian, and it's actually programmed in JAGS or something like that. So it's a completely different sort of programming language. It's not TMB on ADMB. And the Japanese software uh, suite has uh, VPAs. So that's quite different from uh, most of the other models there. So some of the interesting results. Um, I find this interesting is, is that only nine out of the 14 have sex structure. And for a lot of species, we know there's differences in natural mortality and growth and things like that. So um, that's one component that's actually not seen in all of these uh, models. Um, only two of them have multi-species technical interactions. That was uh, Gadget and Poseidon. You can add Seattle in there, of course. Uh, Seattle hasn't given me a survey yet, so... Uh, where, <laughs> where's Jim? <laughs> I, I think Jim was busy writing a stock assessment. Um, yeah, um, and also there may be a few mistakes in here as well, so we're going to have to um, double check with some of the uh, survey results um, before we do anything official with this. Uh, Multi-species but with trophic interactions, um, gadget, and that's actually one question we should really think about here is whether the uh, next generation model needs trophic interactions because then we're getting into a, a more of a complicated type model. Predator prey. Okay, so something we should discuss tomorrow maybe at the next discussion period. Uh, growth platoons, there's only four um, models that had that. Um, there's tagging, area structure, stock structure, um, most of them maximum likelihood, but Poseidon and Jabba are different. One's agent-based and one's uh, Bayesian, fully Bayesian. Um, only three have random effects. It's Wham, Jabba, and stock synthesis. Well, okay. So with synthesis, it has, there's, there's approximate methods that papers have used to do it. But any of these models that use MCMC and do Bayesian and do penalized likelihood have random effects. Um, there's just some complications in estimating the variance in the maximum likelihood. So you can do the Bayesian from the uh, variance covariance matrix as the, um, the jumping rule. Um, and, and Gadget has hereditary genetics type component to it too, which is something we haven't talked about uh, at this yet. Um, can we hear something about, I mean, I was very interested to see the uh, genetics in Gadget. And, yeah. and certainly, you know, that sounds impressive, but I'd be really intrigued to know, A, what, what level of genetic structure you're talking about and, and are these actually used in real assessments? Used in real assessments? No. Uh, but you can include these information as, as basically as a stock, stock mixture component. Okay, so this is not genetic structure, this is stock mixture proportions. Okay, so that's something that synthesis can do and, well, not well, stocks, but. No, it's not heritable, it's, it's, it's just it's stock, stock, stock structure as being. Yeah. So I think we should call that in stock mixing, mixing data, really, yeah. from genetics. Yeah, yeah. I, when, I, when I was thinking about, I was thinking about more you would have genetically different individuals that, I guess, inherited things in the model. So, you know, you, you had these fish spawned and they gave rise to fast growing fish or something like that. Exactly. Yeah. Yeah. That, but that's yeah. basically what you can, you can do with different stocks in, in gadget. But you, okay. Yeah. Yep. Okay. So I'm um, looking at some of the rare features. So, so these are some of the things that might want to go into, um, into the next generation model since they're only in a few of them. So there's morph composition, uh, which is what, kind of the thing we're talking about there, maybe in the genetics, uh, stock origin, uh, environmental index, which surprisingly, yes, that's what it basically does. So it's its main focus. Um, yeah, uh, growth increment, um, which is an interesting thing. So some of the information we get for growth curves is from growth increment data and um, integrating that into the model would be great. 
GMAX does it because it's a length-based model. Uh, Casal and Gadget do it. I'm not sure if they do it correctly. There's a lot of issues with, with doing it, but we'll... Gadget's length, right? Gadget's right. It has age and length? Yeah. Yeah, okay. Uh, close kin, nobody does that. Uh, gene tagging, I'm not sure if there's anything specific about genetic mark recapture that you would require. Um, some changes to the model, but maybe not. Uh, VPA, so um, one question, so only the, the Japanese um, software program uses VPA, um, and as a SAM method is basically VPA, but it's in a statistical approach. So the question is, does what SAM do adequate enough for most applications or all applications, or would you, if implementing a VPA in there would, would make sense? You can sort of uh, amputate SAM enough to be a VPA yeah. by setting certain variable, variable parameters, big or small. So yeah. I would say it's close enough. Yeah. I, I'd agree. I think the whole, I mean, VPA sort of fails the paradigm of, of state-space modeling. VPA was designed in an era when most of us were in nappies. Um, I, yeah. you know, I would do it in a state space formulation. I wouldn't, I wouldn't make the assumption that you've got catch at age measured without error in any assessment because it's I, not. Yeah. I guess the one advantage is if you implement it as a VPA, then it would be a lot quicker than estimating all the parameters. That would probably be the only advantage. Yeah. yeah. Jim. I don't think you asked them. He asked if there was going to be aging error or imprecision included. Could we, could we capture that in our survey, aging error? I don't no. think so. I think yeah. most of them actually do do aging error now. Yeah. I got to check. I don't know if I put it in there, but we, let's see. And so we might actually get back to all the people with some extra questions and clarifications on this anyway. Um, and density dependent natural mortality was only in two software. Packages. Yeah. yeah. Okay. So, if there's any, if there's not any question, yeah, Jim. Yeah. So, so related to this, I know, I know the title was general models, um, but in terms of features, you know, close kin and gene tagging have been implemented in in the eighty model builder model, mm -hmm. um, eight structured. So there's been a lot of other, and so I, I wonder if there should be a catch-all, maybe um, other, other model, not that it's, there's other general models out there, but there might be other examples that could have already been done and borrowed for any future development, if that makes sense. You mean like code we could take and plug in somewhere or something? Yeah, like somebody said close kin genetics likelihood hasn't been written. I know Rich has written the likelihood for yeah, close kin genetics. Yeah, yeah, but this was more comparison of general stock assessment methods, what features they have and what we'd need, not necessarily that it hasn't been done in the past in a sort of like a custom built model or something. Yeah, Jeremy. Uh, just making a plug because I know Ian Doonan's struggling with this at the moment. Um, does anybody have sex change? Yeah. And have done it? yeah. I that's think. in um, SS. Yeah, yeah, okay. That's actually you. I didn't put it there. Yeah. No. Just migration. Yeah. Yeah, Nesta. To ask one, one thing that, that was mentioned here before was simulation. And we don't have that on this. I don't remember if you had it on your question here. But yeah, I think I did, but I didn't put it here because this was more for yeah. features or other. I, I had it in mine too. and it was most of them, not yeah. all, but it was well over half of them had a simulation capacity. And then there was something, I mean, I, there was a slightly smaller number had MSE, but I don't know if I would have classified the MSE as MSE as opposed to forecasting. I think the, the, the simulation feature is, a, is an important one. And, and the other thing is actually being able to, to extract or derive or compute the, the variance covariance matrix of the parameters. Because I remember, for example, with Gadget, when I was working with Gadget some years ago, that was a huge problem because you couldn't compute any variance with Gadget and that was a nightmare because it was so slow. Yeah. 
So this is another thing. These are two features that I don't remember if you had on your survey, but it would be. I think I said un had uncertainty estimates on there. I think, yeah. But. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. Well, I think we should finish for the day. Everyone's probably getting thirsty.